Well, good morning and welcome to our virtual life group lesson. And today we are going to be studying from the book of Romans. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. Your literature, if you have it in front of you, uh, leaves out 6, 7, and 8. But you know me, I'm not going to leave those out. They actually fit into my outline, and I can't leave those out. They're too important. But we're talking about today, the title of the lesson is Living for Christ Changes the Way We Think. Living for Christ Changes How We Think. Now, if you've been listening to me preach, you know this is something I've talked about many times. I bring it up over and over again because it's a critical part of your Christian life is the transformation, the renewing of your mind. Um, God is not happy to simply save your soul and then leave your mind in its unrepentant state. Um, he's not happy to simply give you the promise of eternal life in heaven, but then leave you down here struggling to survive, struggling to make it through in your mind, struggling uh, with all of the negativity that we're bombarded with. He wants to change the way you think so that while you're here living on this planet, you can enjoy your life and have a life that is abundant. That's what Christ said. He wants you to have an abundant life, to not simply survive until you make it to heaven. And so today, as I'm sitting out here on the back porch, and there's a very nice breeze, and uh, I'm, I can even still hear some crickets this morning. It's a little bit early, but uh, I'm thinking about what it means to think differently in Christ Jesus. And so we're going to be talking about that in Romans, and I want you to join with me in chapter 12, and I want to read a few verses, and then we'll stop and, and begin to analyze. He says in verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so the first thing he's telling you is that your physical body, the physical part of you, is a living sacrifice for God. That God gave you this physical body, and for the most part, we enjoy our physical body. Some of us have health issues that we have to struggle with. But we use this physical body to, to navigate through this life, to walk around on this earth, to work, to do the things that we uh, enjoy doing. When you hug your children or your grandchildren, you're using your physical body to enjoy life, to enjoy other human beings. When you uh, go out in the yard, if you're like me and you love to do yard work, you're using your physical body to be out there and to commune with nature and to listen to the birds and to enjoy the literally the sweat of your brow. You're using your physical body to enjoy this life. This body was not created to be a hindrance. It was created to be a vehicle that we use to carry us through this earthly life, to enjoy this life. So that is one of the reasons worship is so important because on Sunday, um, tomorrow morning, we will take our physical bodies to God's sanctuary and take that opportunity to use the physical body to worship Him, to sing to Him. And when you don't use your physical body for worship, you're missing the most important purpose of your body. And it's a shame that Christians use the physical body for pleasure, we use it for work, we use it for all of the things that we think we have to have, but then we consider physically going to worship as optional, and it isn't. We physically need that. That's one of the reasons we have a physical body. And so he says in verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what is he saying? Your physical body is a living sacrifice. And then he says, and your mind needs to be transformed and conformed to the likeness of Christ. We've been talking about that in Sunday morning for the last few weeks. Um, my mind 
because I live in a sinful fallen world, my mind automatically wants to conform to the patterns of the world. And the world is pressuring me to conform. Satan is pressuring me to conform. Peer pressure, we talk about that, but it's very real. Crowd mentality, when everybody else is doing it, we feel like we have to do the same thing. And this is, this is what he's saying. Don't be conformed to the patterns of the world. The world wants you to be living in sin. The world wants you to think this way. The world wants you to be negative. So, but that's not how I want you to think. I want you to not conform to that pattern, but be transformed. Let me change the way you think. He says, then, then, okay, only then, when my body has been offered to God as a living sacrifice, and my mind has been offered to Christ for the renewal process, then I can test and approve His good, pleasing, and perfect will for my life. So, I know that His will is for me to be saved. I know that His will is for me to be transformed. He's already told me that. Um, I know His will is for me to... Uh, conform to the likeness of Christ, well, what are the, the good, perfect, and pleasing will? What is that? That means, what is the specific will that God has for my life? What am I supposed to be doing? Okay, we all have these universal things that we know we're all called to, salvation, transformation, holiness, okay? But what is my, my purpose? What does God want John Gators to do? What does God want you to do? That's what he's saying. You will not know those things until you have surrendered your physical body and your mind. Then he can get to you. Then when you're, when you're in that place spiritually, that's when he can then begin to say, here's what I wanna do with your life. Here's where I want you to go. Here's where I want you to work. Here's where I want you to serve. And unfortunately, most Christians never get there. They never get there. They never go through that process of spiritual transformation. They never go through the process of spiritual growth. They, they just accept Christ. They get their fire insurance, as they say, and then they stop. And they may go to church. They may not. They don't let it interfere too much in their lives. And then they spend their lives wondering, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Well, it's because you haven't followed the plan. Okay? So, he says in verse, uh, excuse me, we didn't turn my page. He says here in verse 3, he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. What is he saying in verse 3? Well, he's saying, don't be one of these people who thinks you don't need to be transformed. That's what he's saying. Do not think yourself more highly than you all. Don't think, I don't need to be transformed. I'm a good person. Well, if I wasn't a good person, God wouldn't have saved me. That's not at all correct. A lot of people think that way, but it's not correct. Uh, we sing just as I am because that's how you come to Christ, but he doesn't say just as I am and stay as you are. The whole point is come just as you are but because I want to change you. I want to get a hold of you and, and turn you around. Um, my daughter Hannah has a Great Dane that she inherited. Okay, It was given to her by uh, another family member. And that family member had gotten the dog almost by accident. Somebody had gotten it, couldn't handle it, um, couldn't deal with it, gave it away, and the relative didn't have time to deal with it and so Hannah inherits this Great Dane which is a huge dog and this dog was completely uncontrollable just a wild dog you know but Hannah has a gift she has a gift with animals but she also has patience and so now that dog is extraordinarily well trained that dog wears a harness and almost well I should say almost practically serves as, as a, uh, a service dog for Hannah with her health issues. Um, that dog can sense when Hannah's losing her balance and will come and put her body up against Hannah's body. 
that dog will now come to my back door in the morning and um, in her own way knock on the door because she wants to come in and see Mimi. And this is a dog that is very well behaved and very well trained, very uh, gentle and easy to be around. But a couple of years ago, this dog was wild. Couldn't You couldn't even pet her. She just run up barking and acting crazy. So where am I going with this? I'm saying it's one thing to save the dog, okay? But why do you want to just save the dog but not make the dog a useful part of your family? So when God saves us, yeah, he's saving us, and we should be grateful for the salvation. We should be grateful for knowing that we won't die and go to hell, okay? But do you want to be a useful part of God's family? Do you want God to be able to train you, to use you? I mean, we're all service animals in that respect, that we're, we're, we're brought in to the family to serve, to minister. It's not really about me, it's about other people. When you begin to understand that, you begin to understand what Christianity is really about, and it's not about me. Yes, it's about my salvation, that's great, that's fabulous. It's about the fact that God loves me and saved me and has a plan for me, that's fabulous. But he has a love and a plan for everybody else, and I'm part of bringing them into the family. I'm part of serving them. And so that's why he says that. Look at verse 4. There's three things we need to consider here as we move into these, into these verses. This is why I said I, I couldn't leave these other verses out. There's three things that Paul here is covering accountability, gifts, and service. And so the first one is accountability. Look at this. He just got through telling us in verse 3, don't think that you don't need to be transformed. Everybody needs to be transformed. But in verse 4, he begins to talk about accountability. He says in verse 4, just as each of us has one body with many members, okay, as I have one body, many members, Ten fingers, ten toes, two arms, two legs, two ears, all that. He's saying, just like that, he says, and these members do not all have the same function, okay? My hands don't have the same function as my feet. My feet don't have the same function as my ears. They're all different. He says in verse 5, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. What? Stop and absorb that. As the body of Christ, I'm not an individual anymore. I am, in the, in the sense that I'm still me. God has not stripped me of my personality. I have not become a robot. I still have my quirky sense of humor, which sometimes gets me in trouble. I, I still have my analytical brain that sometimes drives people insane. I know that. I'm still the same person. But when I am saved and God is beginning this transformation process, he folds me into this group and I become part of a greater body. And I might just be an earlobe. I might be a finger. I might be a fingernail. I might be some part of the body that would seem to be insignificant. And yet, every part of your body is significant. Every part of you has a purpose. And every one of us in God's church has a purpose. And so he's saying, I want you to understand, just like we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others, that means my fingers cannot say, we're not going to participate with the rest of the body. If the body says, we're going to go out there and mow the yard, my hands don't have the opportunity to say, we're not going. We're going to stay here on the porch. The rest of the body can go mow the yard. Well, I kind of need these to push the lawnmower. That's kind of important. And I can't actually remove them, set them aside. Do you understand what he's telling you? As a Christian, part of the body of Christ, not only are you necessary, you're not uh, expendable, you can't be separated. You, you can't just disassociate yourself from the body of Christ and say, I'm going to hang back here. You guys go 
do the work, I'm, you, that's it's not an option. Now, some of you who are older may be thinking, but I'm not physically capable of going. I'm not talking to you. If you are physically incapable, I'm not addressing that. You, uh, if you're bothered by the, I've said this before, if you are bothered by the fact that you can no longer do things, it's probably because you have always done things. You've done your part. You have served your role. If you are still alive, and if you're watching this, I assume you are, if you are still alive, part of the body of Christ, God has not called you home yet, but you're physically unable to physically do things, it's because God is using you as a prayer warrior. Or it could be that your simple presence there is critical to the body. I don't understand all of the ways that God thinks and the ways that God works, and I try not to question it too much, but if you're still physically on this earth, God has a reason for that. And if you're not physically able to do things that you once did, it's probably that you are serving as an inspiration to others and a prayer warrior. And don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. Uh, an elderly person who has time during the day to stop and pray for their pastor, pray for the life group leaders, pray for their deacons, pray for their church members, pray for the, the sick. That is powerful, very powerful. And do not underestimate what God will do with that. So don't think less of yourself because you're not physically able to do those things. I hope and pray that I will be physically able to work until I die. But I may not be. And I'm, I'm accepting that, that my role in life may change as I get older. And that's okay. Because God in His wisdom will take me home at His right time. But I want to talk about the people who are physically able to serve. He's saying you don't have the option of opting out. You can't just say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything here. I'm just going to be a non-essential member of the body, or I'll, I'll, I'll be the appendix. We used to think the appendix was a, a useless thing, and now we've learned that the appendix actually holds a lot of necessary bacteria and things, and that when you get sick, you have some kind of a stomach virus, and you empty all of the good out of you along with the stuff that made you sick your appendix has a way to replenish your intestinal tract and we used to think the appendix was just totally useless like it has no point it does now you can live without it but it's important it's still there for a reason so never think that you have no purpose and no reason in the body of Christ and never think that you're not accountable because he says each member belongs to all those. That means I, I'm, I'm not independent. Um, our church, our church body, I belong to the church body in that respect. I don't quite know how that works. I mean, I, I can't say that I've wrapped my brain around that completely and entirely. But what it means is I'm accountable to the other members of the church. And for me, even more so perhaps than you, because God says that those who are called to teach and to preach the Word of God are actually held to a higher standard. So even more than you, perhaps, I am accountable uh, to the body of Christ. Now, that should be a very humbling thing to realize I'm not a one-man show and nobody in the body of Christ is a one man or one woman show you are not your own program you're part of something greater you're part of something that God is directing that God has implemented God has put all of these people together with their individual gifts and God has placed us and made this church that we call First Baptist Church Bemis and I love it absolutely love it 
And to be part of it is a blessing and an honor. But it's not, I, I don't get to just do what I want to do. God is in control of that. So that's the accountability. And other people are to hold me accountable for that. If I don't do what I'm supposed to do, other people are to be able to come to me in love and say, hey, you need to work on this a little bit. This is one of the reasons I've said I believe we're living in the age of apostasy is because people will not accept rebuke. They simply will not. I don't mean everybody, but generally speaking, um, if you go to somebody in the church and say, you're lacking in this, you, you need to do or you need to not do, they'll just leave. I'm not going to take that, I'll just leave. But the Bible says right here, right there, God said, we all belong to each other. Now, the second thing, I told you there's three things, accountability. The second thing is the gifts. Now he explains to us, we have different gifts. Look at verse 6. According to the grace given to us. Okay, we. This is what's fascinating. God loves us and treats us as individuals. So the gifts that he gives me, according to the grace that is given to me, the gift that he gives to me may be different than the gift he gives to you. It's not because my gift is greater or your gift is greater. It's because... He fine-tunes these things to me, to my personality. He knows how I think and he knows how I am. Now, the parts of me that he wants to change, he's working on transforming my mind so that I think more like him, but he doesn't erase my personality. He does not erase the fact that I'm a very analytical person. I have always been the guy that asks questions, even as a kid, sitting in church listening to the preacher preach. And I would be listening to him preach the Word of God. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I've got questions. Now, it's not because I didn't trust my pastor. Certainly not because I didn't trust God. But it's just how I'm wired. I want to know. Okay? I want to dig deeper in that. Okay? God did not erase that quality from me. He used that quality to make me one of these people who wants to study the Word of God, to, to find the treasures in here. That's just part of how I'm wired, and he wired me that way from the, from the womb because he knew that when I was 30 years old, he was going to call me to be in the ministry, and he knew at 40 he was going to call me to preach, and so I had 40 years of being this inquisitive, always asking questions person, and now I get to take that and, and explain the Word of God to people, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, I don't feel adequate doing it, but I, I, can, I can understand the process that God used to take my personality, the person that He made me, and then take Christ and take this brain and transform it so that I think more like Him and he plugs me into the church and says, okay, you're this part of the body. You're the part that's going to teach people my word. That's God. Now, you have the same thing. God has taken you and your unique personality and your unique different gifts, as he said. And he has called you to be transformed so that he can take those gifts and make you the best version of that. Okay? Not to erase you, but to make you the very best version of who he created you as. Okay. And then plug you into the body and say, now you're the part of the body that will do da-da-da-da-da. That's beautiful. And look what he says about it. He says, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. He's saying, you will prophesy according to your faith. Now, as your faith grows... As you grow and you become spiritually more mature, your prophecies might become more profound. Okay? What does he say? If it is serving, let him serve. So as your faith grows, as you grow in your spiritual maturity, your service may become more profound. You may serve in small ways when you're young and you're a young Christian, but as you are transformed by the renewing of your mind and you become more like Christ and you think more like Christ, your service will grow. 
Why do you think he's, he teaches us that if you're faithful in the small things that he will then reward you with greater things? Because as you're faithful to serve him and your spiritual immaturity, then as you grow spiritually more mature, he's going to use you to serve in greater ways. He says, if it is teaching, let him teach. Same thing. Don't think you have to be uh, this theological genius to teach. You can literally be a facilitator and say, I don't really understand the Word of God that well, but I can facilitate a class. I can ask questions and we can discuss it. I can go and read a commentary and see what other people say about this and we can bring that to class and discuss it. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room to teach a class. You can just say, look, I'm learning like the rest of you, but let's just open up the Word of God and study it and see what we come up with. But as you grow, because I've told people many times, if you want to be a good teacher, start teaching. You may not be a good teacher when you start, but as you do more and more and more and you learn more and more and more, you become a good teacher. But you have to practice. I mean, some people, if you apply their logic to everything else, you would probably never take driver's lessons. You would just go get in a car at 16 and just immediately think that you're going to be a great driver. Um, no, most people <laughs> will not be a good driver unless they've been trained and they've practiced. You, you understand why they say practice makes perfect? You got to practice stuff. You have to do it, okay? If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. You realize that your gift may simply be encouragement. You say, well, how is that a gift? Because not everybody's an encourager. And the world is not an encouraging place. Think about it. Um, I do feel like that's part of me, my personality. I like to find things in people that I like and point them out. Um, I don't like to flatter people, like make stuff up, but when I see you in church or I see you in public and you're wearing a color that makes you look nice, I'm apt to just say, wow, you look nice today. And I'm, that's sincere because that's just, that's just who I am. Uh, I just notice these things and I want to point them out. Um, you do a good job with something. I'm, I'm, I'm prone to just like, I'm impressed. You did a good job with that. I'm realizing that part of the reason that God has put that in me is because we live in a world that's constantly telling you you're not good enough, you don't look good enough, uh, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, um, you're not talented enough, you don't speak well enough. The world tears people down. And in the body of Christ, God has put certain people, and you may be one of those people that God has put there to be an encourager, to tell people, look, you're 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 good we like you <laughs> and also to say and yes you can do things you may think you can't but yes you can that's part of encouragement yes you should try that and if you fail it's okay we still love you encouragement takes so many different forms okay it's not just complimenting people it's not just pointing out their good qualities but sometimes it's just saying hey don't give up or you're discouraged because um, your your prayers are taking longer to be answered than you thought. That's okay. God's encouraging. God's told me to tell you it's okay. You're loved. You're 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 cared for. Encouragement takes many many forms, and some people think it's it's one of those useless gifts. It's one of the most important gifts. He says if he's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. Some people have the gift of giving. And it's usually not the wealthiest people. Um, people who have a lot of excess sometimes will be used and they will give a lot. And those times, are that's wonderful. We're grateful for that. But sometimes it's people who don't have much who are the most generous givers. They, they'll literally open their wallet and think, I only have $40 and that's got to get me to the end of the week. But I know that Susie over here, 
she can't pay her utility bill. And if I gave her $20, that would help her. And that means I'm gonna have to scrimp on my lunch this week. I, I don't know, I'm, I may have to cut out a couple of trips because I may not have enough gas money, but I'm gonna give her that 20 because I know she needs it. There are a lot of people like that in her church. He says, if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If your, if your act of service, if your gift is leadership, he says, be diligent about it. Be, be good about it. It means be consistent about it. People may not like your style of leadership, but at least be consistent and be able to back it up. You know, I, ha I, have, I have some people that don't like my leadership style. Um, and I'm okay with that because my leadership style is based on what I understand of the Bible. I try to follow the, the, the Apostle Paul in particular. Um, I try to follow the leadership qualities of Jesus, and sometimes they're misunderstood. Um, but Paul is another good example of somebody, and he was often criticized for being a poor leader. But in retrospect, we go back and we look and we say, no, he was an excellent leader. People just didn't always appreciate it. I try my best to follow biblical examples, and I try to be consistent with it. And that's what he says. Um, you, you could be the same way. You may be called to lead. You may be uh, the, the chairperson of a committee, and it may be that you are leading people to make decisions about how things should be done within the church. And he's not saying that you're going to be perfect. But he's saying if that's your gift and that's the role that you're playing, be diligent with it. Just be consistent, do your best, cover it with prayer. And if people don't like it, it's okay. Don't stop loving them, but just explain to them, well, here's here's my reasoning. Okay, this is this is why I feel that we need to do this. And if you have biblical basis for it then the rest of the body generally will say, well, even if we disagree with you, we understand your biblical grounds and we'll accept it. And then he goes on, he says, if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Some people just have the gift of mercy, just to be merciful on others. I think that is one of the greatest gifts within our church body. I see that when people come to our church and maybe they come and they're a little bit concerned about how am I going to be received. Maybe they have some things in their life that they're not uh, proud of. And one of the things that I hear over and over again from people is, I felt loved and welcomed. I didn't feel like I was being judged. That's mercy. So we have accountability, we have gifts, and I'm running over, so let me, let me get this out here really quickly. Then he says, service. Look at verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. So if you are accountable to one another and you have gifts that you have to use and gifts that you can bring, he's saying, now, this is, this is how you apply it. And this is what should be the, the end result is that we grow in our love, that we cling to one another, that we are devoted to one another and we love one another as brothers and sisters. He says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In other words, don't let circumstances stop you from serving God. You're doing it for God ultimately, not for other people, but you are serving God by serving his people. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. So he's telling you, you're going to be afflicted as a member of the body of Christ. You're not going to be free, like Satan can't touch me, like nothing bad will happen to me. I don't care what the prosperity preachers tell you, he's telling you as you serve the Lord and grow in your wisdom, grow in your maturity, and you take care of other people, you will be afflicted. But be patient through that affliction. And he says, and be faithful in your prayer because you're gonna need to pray your way through a lot of things and he says, and to have hope. Have hope for the future. Don't lose your hope. And he says, finally, share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. He's saying, be kind, be loving, be merciful to one another. That's a whole lot to unpack today. Let's just pray that God will help us to understand it. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are so kind and so good to us. And we thank you, Father, that you have 
given us each individual gifts. You have given us acts of service. You have placed us within your body for a reason, for service. We pray, dear God, that you would cover us and bless us. Help us to do the very best that we can. Father, help us to always be joyful in our hope, to be patient in our affliction, and Father, to be fervent in our prayer, and Father, to love one another and to show mercy, kindness, hospitality, so that the lost world will look at that and say, I need that in my life. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining me here on the back porch. I look forward to these times that we get to spend with us, we to each other. Excuse me. I know it's only virtual, but I still feel like we just have that connection and it makes me very happy. So God bless you and I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful week ahead.